we're doing this new series called Naked. And so really what that is, is to help you to understand a bit more about how the vision becomes a reality in our church. Many of you know the vision, don't you, of Metro? What is the one word vision? Transformation. You hear it every Sunday. Some of you are like, oh, please stop saying it. But it's important that you know it. And if you're like a project manager, you're very linear in your thinking, you might have actually asked yourself, how does that happen though here at this church? And so it really happens in one key way. It happens as we live out our core values. We have four of them in this church, and they are literally the blueprint to how the vision becomes a reality in our church. If you ever want to live out a life of transformation, this is not just for the macro church, but this is also for your life. We believe that the four Four R's, we call them relevance, relationship, reflection, and response, is absolutely vital that they become a normal part of the rhythm of your life. That if they can become a normal rhythm of your life, you'll experience transformation in every area of your life, but also this church then, because church is made up of people, will be transformed as well. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to unpack every core value on its own for one week. So I'm doing relevance today. Next week, I'll do relationship. The third week, we're going to do respondent response, which is responding to the needs of the hurting. I'm excited to share with you that Eugene Cho will be with us during that week to unpack that because that's really what he feels God has called him to, to do with his own life. And he's got a new book that just came out. Uh, and then it, it'll be, uh, uh, it'll be a reflection afterwards on that. So, so I hope that you guys will be excited about it. But the next four weeks is really to help you to imp implement these four core values into your life so that you can live a life of transformation. And so today it's, it's about relevance. And uh, many of you don't know our core values. In fact, you know, sometimes my, my staff don't even know the core values. And so I, I, I have to be reminded that we have to get to a point where we share these things more often. And so that's why we decided to dedicate four weeks out of the year to really focus and hone in on these four core values. So let's dissect this a little bit. Relevance. Can we show that first slide? Relevance. What is relevance? We believe that relevance is about us connecting Jesus with today's generation by incorporating creativity and integrity in all that we do. That's key for us, all right? Basically, in a nutshell, it's to make sure that we are relevant to an unchurched population or an unchurched generation. How, is, how does that happen? Well, here's how it happens. Let's unpack that a little bit more. This is all on our website. It's in your bulletin. Don't recycle your bulletin, please. Take it home for the next four weeks. And I want you to have this in writing so you can see it, all right? You could also go on our website and read it as well. But here's what it says. It says, allowing people to see that Jesus Christ is relevant in their lives is our chief task. We truly believe that life with Jesus is far better than anything else the world has to offer. We believe that in order to impact our generation, the presentation of the gospel must be relevant. We do this by first acknowledging the suffering in our world, not hiding behind religion, but allowing suffering to enter our spiritual journey. I'm gonna spend the majority of the sermon today just really talking about that, all right? So I'm not going to sort of expound upon that first part of relevance. Here's the second part. We recognize that we need to constantly seek new ways of doing church. One way is by embracing creativity and how we express our worship to Jesus by embracing the arts. In a world where the arts have dictated the pace of the culture, we too are committed to the arts, striving to impact culture rather than to react to it. Let me just briefly share what that is. Many of you might have been a part of traditions where maybe the arts were not very important to you. In fact, your church maybe wouldn't really focus much on the arts. The arts is really is, sets the pace of the culture today. If we're ever going to make the gospel relevant to a, church, to a community that don't know Jesus, we have to tap into the arts, right? And you know what the sad thing is about the arts? I think Christians have surrendered it to the world. Because the last place your friends, your unchristian friends, will ever think of a place where the arts actually pulsates, they'll never think it's the church. They always think it's in Hollywood, outside of the church. And if, if we are to believe the Bible, the Bible teaches us that God created the arts. And if God created the arts, therefore then, as Christians, part of our task in life today is for us to reclaim it for him again. And so part of our church, this is why we have a budget for the arts. This is why Tim is here doing the production arts. This is why we have Angela Robinson doing performance arts. This is why Young is here doing the worship arts. That's important to us. And it will always be. Why? Because we're never going to be a church of true transformation and be able to reach people who don't know Jesus unless the arts become important to us. All right? That's, that's the vision of this church. So that's an important aspect to it. All right? Hope you guys follow with me on that. Now the, sec the last part of this is this. With an ever-increasing global vision, 
village, we also believe the church should be the model for racial diversity. Since Jesus came to remove the racial and socioeconomic barriers that separate us, we will keep ourselves from perpetuating those barriers by passionately embracing each other's culture and background and celebrating this diversity. Take a look around, you'll find that people, God has brought the nations to our church. We are grateful for that. We believe that God has called us to be a multiracial community. If you're kind of new here and you thought that Metro was just like a, an Asian church, or and that Asian is diverse as well. I don't want to pigeonhole us and say that Asian churches are, are, are not diverse. They are, because if you're Korean and Chinese, we're very different, aren't we? Right? If you're, if you're Japanese and Filipino, you're very different. But we're more of a multi-ethnic community. And so we're here to embrace each other's background. And what that really does many times is that it forces us to do things we may not want to do. And sometimes it bids us and it calls us to do things that we know we should be doing. Right? A lot of times, we're not going to be comfortable with this part, with this last part of relevance here, when we talk about this idea of us being a multiracial community. But that's what it's about. It's about us understanding this. And I know in the last couple of weeks, Michael came and spoke to you and spent a lot of time talking about Ferguson. We heard some of you, and I know some of you are kind of fed up about talking about this stuff. And you're saying, some of you probably have thought to yourself, if you're anything like some of the other folks that have talked about this topic, you said, you know what? Let's just wait till all the facts come out. Out. Let's wait till all the facts come out, then we can judge. But you know how narrow-minded that is? Because we can't make this an isolated event. Do you realize the reality of what's happening? If you're an African-American, you understand the depth of this. Because this has been going on for generations. And so because it's been going on for generations, they carry a heavy heart. That whenever things like this come and it arises out of the news, and they hear other people who aren't African-American saying, let's just wait till all the facts come out. Do you know how angry and upset they get? because of that and as a church and as a community no matter how difficult it might be for you if we're ever going to be a church of relevance and transformation this has to be something that's important to us and many of us may not want to go there but we have to be willing to go there we do and that's why a few weeks ago we did the march we went to Inglewood when we did the march i came i just came back from korea and i decided to go and somebody said hey aren't you still on sabbatical i said yeah but this is something that's important to me don't misunderstand i'm not like this holy person that has this revelation that this is how we need to do this the only reason why i understand the plight of the reality of this is because i have dear friends that are african-american and they share with me the difficulty it is to live in this country I have a friend who says they're glad that they just have a daughter, that they don't have a son. When was the last time Asians and Caucasians, you ever thought that? Like, I'm glad I have a daughter, not a son, because an African-American boy living in this country is very difficult. You see, what I'm saying is that if we're ever going to do this church of relevance, it has to bid us to do things that maybe you're not wanting to do. And I think the, one of the first things we can do as a community is that we, God's brought the nations to us. Sit down, befriend, learn, grow, understand, be in a relationship. Because when you're in relationships with people, they no longer become a black, white, Asian issue. It's my brother's issue, my sister's issue. And that's why I take a big cause to this. And it bothers me sometimes when I hear people talk. I have family members that have mindsets like that, and I have to really bite my tongue. But as a church, this is what God's called us to do. Is it comfortable? No. But if we're ever going to reach out to an unchurched generation, if we're ever going to get to a place where God uses us to be a church of transformation, these are conversations that we have to have as a community. What's going on in ISIS is horrible. All of you know that. And as Christians, we've got to take a stand as well. Right? We're talking about how we can partner with some organizations that do some tremendous relief work in those areas that are hit by what ISIS is doing to Christians and to Muslims alike in those areas. These are important things that we need to talk about, that we need to, we need to consider to be important in our lives. So that's relevance. If we do these things, transformation becomes a reality. So Paul today is going to teach us how you and I can find relevance in our life today. Because I think some of you struggle with this, especially as you get older. You wonder if your life is really significant. That's why many men hit a midlife crisis. Because you're thinking, man, is my life really significant? I will also go as far as to say that for many of you, you stayed up at nights at times and you've wondered if your faith in Jesus is relevant. Because maybe as you struggle through some parts of your life, you've asked yourself, God, are you really here? Are you really relevant in my life today? 
And so as we dig into this core value, which I find is that us being relevant to an unchurched generation, for us to find relevance in our own life and relevance in God and God alone, you'll find that all those three things, they connect under this one powerful principle that Jesus and Paul the Apostle teaches us. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at the first 12 verses in this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, excuse me. Paul says, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heavens, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of God. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. And so, God, we come to you today, and we ask that you would really speak to us through this text. And God, um, help us to understand that often our, our process of growth and spiritual growth is for us to be placed in discomfort, places where we're not very comfortable, we don't feel safe. And I believe that this is a message today where you're gonna call us to sort of get out there and to sort of live on, in areas of our lives that we maybe are not comfortable living, but help us to do so, because if we do, God, I believe we'll find you to be so relevant in our lives today, and thereby finding deeper significance and the world will be able to see that you truly are our Lord and Savior. So I pray that the words that come out of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, I pray that it will be pleasing unto you. In your name we pray, amen. And so in this passage, Paul teaches a very simple principle. If you come to this church, you hear me preach, I probably share this at least once, twice a month. So you're like, oh, I got, you're gonna share that again? But I've never really expounded on chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians in depth like this, all right? Paul says this, is that if you simply wanna to get to a point in your life where you feel that God is truly significant in your life, because I know if you're human today, that there are moments in your life where you wonder, God, are you really relevant in my life? If you ever wanna to get to a point where you actually feel your life is significant, and you want to become salt and light because to be relevant to an unchurched population is not about just this thing that we should do, but it's something that God commands us to. The Great Commission is a mandate by God that he encourages us to go out and make, a, make disciples of all nations, to go make an impact. We do it, Paul says, by embracing this key principle of embracing our weaknesses embracing our weaknesses. Now that's very contrarian to the world in which you and I live in today. Because everything that we sort of are exposed to, whether it be in television, right, whether it be at our jobs, everything that we're naturally associated, that we associate with, is always in a place of strength, right? The world doesn't teach us. In fact, the world doesn't have much room for people who embraces their weaknesses. And so Paul is saying something very deep here. He's saying that if you want to get to a point in your lives where you actually grow and you find your faith to be relevant, it's about you embracing your weaknesses, your junk and your pain, right? It's a powerful teaching. And Paul is saying this in a very deep way because his apostleship had been, had been under fire during this time. You see, Paul planted the church of Corinth and he was with that community for two years. Then he he left it because Paul was a tent maker. And as he was outside of the community of Corinth, what happened was that these other leaders started to emerge. And these leaders started to really flaunt their charisma. The charisma meaning also their charismatic gifts, their spiritual gifts. These people spoke in tongues. These people had tremendous prophetic visions and understanding. They would pray for people. People would be healed. And as they were doing this, what happened was that the church saw that and they were enamored with it. And they said, wow, you guys are really spiritual. And then they questioned if Paul was really spiritual. And so Paul, I love it, in this passage, he speaks in the third person. He says, I know a man 14 years ago who was literally taken up into the heavens and he saw inexpressible things that no man should ever utter on this earth. That was him. He says, I will not boast 
about those things. Paul says, I won't. Because I've learned early on that if I'm going to experience God's grace, if I'm going to experience his mercy, if I'm going to experience relevance in my life with God, I have to embrace my weaknesses. You see, the essence of the gospel, Metro, is a theology of weakness. Think about this. Jesus in heaven had all the power, everything, strength. He gave it all up and became weak and became one of us so that we can be at a place of harmony with God today. The gospel teaches us this whole theology of weakness. And so therefore, if you and I want to experience relevance in life with God, if we want to make a difference in this world, how is it going to happen? It's going to be through your pain. It's going to be through your weakness, not your strengths. Amen? Sobering truth, but a truth that you and I need to embrace because the world will never connect with your strengths. They'll never connect with your strengths, especially your spiritual strengths. If you get up early in the morning and you pray, if you read the Bible religiously, you attend community groups and, and you're a part of those things, the world's not going to identify with that, but they will identify with your pain. They'll identify if you grew up with an, ab an abusive home. They'll identify if you're struggling today with addictions like drugs or different things like that. They'll understand the depth of those things. They'll connect with you. And in the process of that, my hope is that they will also learn of the redemptiveness to God. Because if you're going to believe this to its entirety, it teaches you that in your weakness, Christ's strength is perfected in you. Now you're saying, well, Paul is saying that in 2 Corinthians. It's just Paul, right? No, it's not Paul. In fact, this is Jesus. It's in red letters. Jesus is the one who utters these words, that in your weakness, my strength is perfected in you. But what you're finding in the scriptures, you're finding that there are litany of stories where you see this idea that weakness oftentimes perpetuates God's grace, his mercy being perfected in human beings, whether it's one person or whether it's the entire people of God, right? And in seminary, I learned a very important Latin word. It's called ex nihilo. Ex nihilo means barrenness, out of barrenness, out of nothingness. And what you find in the Bible throughout Genesis to Revelations, you find that God works most powerfully in ex nihilo. Meaning, if you want God to really work in your life today, within his grace, you have to embrace your own ex nihilo for your life today. In Genesis 1, how did God create the world? Did he create it out of something? No, it teaches us very simply that God created the world out of what? Out of nothing, out of barrenness. You ever ask yourself the question, why did God wait till Sarah was 90 years old when her womb was closed and Abraham was 100 when they really couldn't give birth? They couldn't, scientifically, medically speaking, it was impossible. Why did God wait till Sarah was that old before they had their first child? You ever ask yourself that question? You ever ask yourself the question, why did God wait till Moses was in his mid-80s to call his people out of Egypt? Why, and, and, and when he was a fugitive and he was really suffering from a real deep speech impediment? Why didn't God call Moses to do this when he was in his early 20s? When he was living in Pharaoh's palace, when he was part of royalty, when he had all the privilege and the power, why couldn't God call him in the prime of his life? Why did he wait till Moses was in his 80s? Do you ever ask yourself those questions when you read the Bible? You ever ask the question, why did God tell Gideon to downsize his army from 30,000 men to 300? And then he says, now I want you to go and fight the Midianite army. You ever ask yourself, why? Why would God take a 12-year-old girl who is a virgin and say, you will have an immaculate conception and give birth to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? You ever ask yourself the question, why would God do that? The reason why is because the element of human possibility must be destroyed if you want to experience God's grace in its purest form. And today, if you long for that, if you want to experience that, you too have to get to the point in your lives too where you can be okay within your weakness. Can you imagine what your marriages will look like today? If you can just admit your weaknesses. When it's not about you trying to help your spouse to grow and, and be a certain way, but you just admit your own junk, your own faults. Could you imagine what your marriages would look like today? Could you imagine what your relationship with your parents or, or family members or even exes would be like today if you can actually look at your own junk? The reason why some of you are so miserable, you stay up at nights and you wonder, God, are you really real? It's because you're unwilling to embrace your weaknesses, your junk the things in your life that often plague and hurt you in your life. It's about embracing it, embracing those weaknesses. 
When my wife first married me, I say this a lot, she didn't marry a man. She married a little boy. And I was a little boy, emotionally. I would never take responsibilities for anything that she, I thought she did wrong. And I would always, I think part for me was that, because I saw this the way my parents would always fight, was that it was more important to be right than to be wrong. And it was more important to be right than actually be righteous. And so, man, for the first year and a half or so of our marriage, I mean, it was always about me just blaming her, flipping things around and stuff. And then God one day convicted me so much when I was in California, and he said, you're just like your father. You're just like your father. Now, if you're a psychologist and you understand what a genogram is, if you look at my genogram and you look at my relationship with my parents, because that's the only one as I know, because my grandparents, I never knew, I never grew up with them, and they died too early, you'll find that there's very little chance that my marriage will actually make it because of the way my parents uh, related. Because you learn, you, you absorb a lot of that stuff as you grow up and as you see those things, you become like your parents, even though you don't want to become like that. And when God showed me that I'm becoming just like my dad, it really freaked me out. And that was the day where I said, okay, I'm gonna start owning up to what I did wrong. I'm gonna start not looking at her wrong, but I'm gonna look at my wrong. And it's been wonderful. And you know, we've been um, married almost 15 years. It'll be 15 years in 10 days. No, 13 days, 13 days, 12 days, 12 days. I'm, I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> I'm not a mathematician, David, sorry. <laughs> and uh, you know, I spent two months with that woman every single day, every single minute, 24 seven for two months straight. Man, some of you married couples, man, if you were with your spouse for two months straight, 24-7, without a break, you'd probably go crazy. You're like, man, thank God you go to work. <laughs> thank God you get out of this house because I can't stand you sometimes, right? Two months every day, 24-7. And we had our tiffs. We had our little fights. But it was wonderful. And when we came back home and she went back to work, she went to work before I did, um, it was real sad to not have her with me all the time. And I'm thankful for that. Because I feel like the marriage has become a strength. What should have been a weakness is now a place of strength in my life. But I had to be willing to embrace my weaknesses so that Christ's strength can be perfected in me. Why is that so hard for you to grab onto today? I mean, you hear me talk about it. It's not like a broken record. But how come that's so difficult for you to embrace in your own life? Why are we so afraid to do this? If God's grace, if you believe what Jesus is saying here, that in your weakness, my strength is perfected in you, why are we so at a place where we want to live out of strength or even false strength? Why can't you understand this deep principle today that if you want to experience relevance in life through God and impact this world for Jesus Christ, it's going to happen through your pain, through your weaknesses, as you're willing to do that, because then you start to see things. God shows you things. You're able to live in deeper relationships. So some of you, this really becomes hard. But you know, your weaknesses is the basis to Christ's power being beautifully unleashed in your life today. So how do we do this? I got two thoughts with you, and then I got to try to finish up real quick here, all right? So the first one is this. In order for you to embrace that weakness so that God can be more relevant in your life, and you can live out this core value of relevance, is that you got to learn to be transparent. Now, I know that's not easy for you. And some of you might have been burned by this. I understand that. But understand this, that holiness is not defined by what you do, what you don't do. A lot of times you think holiness is about what you don't do, what you do do. It's not what holiness is about. At the end, holiness is about transparency. It's about you being open and honest. Not with everyone, God forbid, but with just a few that you really trust. Sit down and ask and learn. It's a beautiful thing. I encourage you, and I did this before I left here. I think it's so important for you to sit down because you, even no matter how much you reflect on your own, you're not going to know everything about yourself and especially your flaws, your blind spots, right? You know who's going to know that much more than you? It'll be people who are close to you, like your spouse, potentially even brothers and sisters, best friends, your employees, If you're a boss, I'd encourage you to go to your employees this week and say, hey, can you share a few weaknesses that you see in me? I'm not going to fire you. <laughs> you may get a raise. You may get a raise if you share it with me. It's a beautiful, wonderful spiritual practice for us to partake in. Embrace it. Be transparent. And then when you're able to share it with people, man, and especially unchurched folks, they hear it. But then they also, as you're doing this, if you believe in what Jesus is saying here in 2 Corinthians, then you'll start to experience God's grace in massive amounts. And then redemption starts to happen. Then it becomes beautiful. It really does. 
right? You know, the, the good uh, Easter is so powerful. Yes, Jesus resurrected, but without Good Friday, I don't know. Good Friday takes Easter to a whole nother level because we understand the pain, the suffering, and the place of weakness that Jesus Christ was in. It's the same with your life. We're so quick to talk about redemption without first embracing the Good Friday moments of our life. And that's what Paul is trying to say, that if you want to experience redemption, which is really the heart of the gospel, man, if you want life, you got to first get to a point where you embrace the death parts of your life. That's an important thing, amen? So that's something that you need to do. So be honest, be transparent. You see, if you don't do that, then you know what you fall under the curse of? You fall under the curse of being judgmental. The reason why you, you struggle so much with this whole transparency thing, that when I see people who are very judgmental, I realize these are people who are living in ignorance and they're not living in a place where they've embraced their weaknesses. Because people who judge and they're so angry, you know, you ever wonder why you're so angry? You ever wonder, I used to say anger, you, you're angry because you're fearful. Yes, that's true. But you're also angry a lot of times because you judge so harshly. Because when you judge, judging already presupposes condemnation. You're already at a point, if you're willing to judge someone, then you're so quick to condemn them. And that's why we get so angry all the time. You ever wonder why you're so angry at your parents? Like, why do I get so angry at my mom or my dad? Why does my wife really get under me? Because you freely choose to judge those people. And when you do, you condemn them so hard and you hit them with blows, with words that you would never share with other people that you actually would rather not judge. I believe it's a symptom of us not being transparent. And you and I need to learn to be open, to be transparent, to be in that place. I was at this church, I took my mom to a Korean church when I was in uh, Korea. It was one of the largest churches in Korea, 60,000 people. I mean, it's massive, massive. We don't have anything like that here in the States. And we went to the church service and I was really blessed, I was. And after the service was over, um, we went outside and then we saw a bunch of older people picketing and saying, and I couldn't read it, but I asked my mom, what does that say? It says, the pastor must resign, pastor leave, senior pastor must resign. I'm thinking, whoa, what happened? Like he must either be doing something really right to get that kind of protest, or he's doing actually something really wrong. All right, so then I, I met up with uh, a staff member of this church, and he oversees the English ministry of the church. And so I simply asked him, what's going on here? And he shared with me that a few years ago, what happened was that there was a rumor that stated that the pastor um, plagiarized his uh, PhD dissertation. And when that rumor started to surface, he went public and he told everyone, he said, I did not plagiarize that dissertation. If I did, if I did, if I'm lying, he said, I will step down from being the senior pastor of this church. And then a few months later, somebody proved it because they got the sources and they saw it. And so he was caught red handed. And he said publicly, I'm sorry that I lied, but he didn't step down. And so those people that were standing outside with those signs up were actually elders of the church. I couldn't believe this when he was telling me this stuff. And he was saying that a lot of times they, they have staff meetings and the thing they talk a lot about the staff meeting is how do we protect our senior pastor? Because there were violent threats against them as well. And I'm just thinking, man, I can't even fathom it. They, they talk at their staff meetings about what will happen if the pastor goes up to preach a sermon and then the elders charge at him and start beating him down. I'm thinking, man, what would happen if that happened to me? Like, I just thought that's crazy, right? Like, why would you want to be in a church like that when they're that angry? Like, just leave. I just thought, oh man, he would have saved himself so much heartache if, if he could have just shared, I'm sorry, I did plagiarize. English is my second language. I was in a very busy season of ministry. I couldn't do it. And so I plagiarized. I mean, I think the community would have forgave him if he did that. See, this idea of transparency is so deep and it's so important. Because as you do that, then Christ's strength is unleashed. His grace is unleashed in your life. It's so important for us to embrace and be transparent. But that's so difficult, isn't it? Now, I want to encourage you, please understand the depth of this. That If you can be transparent that way, then I believe then you experience God's grace in massive amounts. And probably the reason why you're not experiencing that these days and you're struggling so much is because you're not willing to be that kind of transparent person and embracing the reality of your brokenness in that capacity. The last thing is you need to live 
your life to glorify God. You need to live your life to glorify God. Look at verse 6. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than what is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness is in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties for when I am weak then I am strong. A powerful teaching by Paul a powerful saying that you and I need to center our lives and living our lives to glorify God. Now we can say amen to that. Say amen to that. Isn't that true? You should live your life to glorify God. But the truth is it's so difficult to do that. And the reason why is because of our self-centeredness. Your greatest temptation that you struggle with, my greatest temptation that I struggle with, I say this to all the pastors that I meet and I coach, all right? The greatest temptation that humans will struggle with is not us lusting after things. That's a temptation, but that's not your greatest temptation. You know what your greatest temptation is? Your greatest temptation in life is you wanting other people to lust after you. That is the greatest temptation in all of life today. And because that is your greatest temptation, because that is my greatest temptation, we struggle with the realities of wanting to live our life to glorify God. And this is why Paul says this is the truth. I can boast about everything. If you look at my spiritual pedigree, no one can match, even come close to me. I can boast about everything. I can share with you all the things God's doing in my life, but I won't do it. I will boast about my weaknesses because at the end, I know what my calling is. My calling is to live my life to glorify God. And if I boast about myself, then the reality is I'm just becoming a spiritual narcissist and I'm not truly living my life in such a way where your glory is brought to God. Amen? I mean, it's deep, isn't it? We want people to lust after us. We do. We want people to do that. Pastors, we struggle with it. We want people to lust after. We want to say, hey, can you come speak at this conference? Can you come and speak at that conference? Can you please write a book? We want to be lusted at. It's just, it's an epidemic. It's the reality of the culture in which you and I live in today. And the only way we're going to do battle with this, the only way we're going to be able to live our lives in a way where God's grace is really being lived out in our lives in that way, is Paul said, you got to embrace your weaknesses. This could be a matter of your life and death. Spiritual life for sure, but even physical, emotional, whatever it is. Because we're so self-centered. It's always about us, isn't it? It's always about us. And Paul's saying, you must be careful. Even suffering could be about you. Paul's talking about suffering could be a blessing, right? But understand when he talks about this, he's not glorifying suffering. He's not because he's praised that God would take the suffering away. Some of you take suffering to be your badge of honor. You love it. You're like, yeah, I suffered. I'm a real Christian. That's right. You make it all about you. And some of you share your suffering so that everyone could be like, oh, are you okay? You want me to hold you today? Like tomorrow? And if they don't offer that, what happens to you? Oh, you get angry. You get very upset because they haven't met your expectations because this is all about you. It's not about glorifying God. See, when Paul lists in verse 10 all the different types of suffering, note they're in the passive tense. That's key. Because if they were in the future tense, then he would say, look forward to it. This is the reality of your spirituality. Paul's not saying the more you suffer, the more spiritual you are. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying this. When you suffer, it allows you to come in contact with your weaknesses so that you can experience God's amazing strength through it. And that is a beautiful truth that you and I need to embrace today in our lives. Amen? Amen. Be weak so Christ can be strong. So being in Seoul, for uh, being in South Korea for two months was really special. Uh, I went there partly because I grew up, if you were born in the early 70s and uh, you grew up in this country, it was tough being a minority. And you know, I I grew up in a predominantly all Caucasian town, a blue collar Caucasian town, and so everyone would make fun of me of the way I looked. And so part of this is because I didn't have a stable home. If I had a stable home, I think I would have really retained my Korean heritage. But because I didn't have a stable home, for me, I wanted to find my stability and my worth in 
my social groups outside. So that was the most important thing for me. And so part of me feeling that in order for me to be accepted by my peers in school was I had to suppress or deny this Korean side of who I am. And so that's what I did. I did that for pretty much all my life. And part of me going back to Korea was really to dig that stuff up and to appreciate and to thank God for making me Korean American. I know what my Korean name means. I'll share with you maybe next week, not this week, okay? I don't want to give you all the good stuff right away. But that was very important. But then when the first week that I went to Korea, my uncle, I said, hey, can you take me to where I was born? Because I've never been there before. I, I grew up, I was born in a town called uh, Pupyeong. It's an Incheon area. And so he took me to the hospital where I was born. And of course, this hospital is much bigger, but this is where I was born. And I just thought, that's so cool. We went inside and I tried to find my birth certificate, but they didn't have it. They didn't keep it from back in the early 70s. But but we went in, I took a bunch of pictures there. Then after there, he took me to the home that I lived in for the first three months of my life. And this is the home. This is the exact home where we lived. And we rang the bell, knocked on the door, hoping that they could answer it so we can walk in. And I wanted to take some more photos inside. But they didn't do any modification to this place. This is an old, rustic apartment. And it's still standing today. I could not believe it. And so that was a real surreal experience for me, thanking God for giving me the opportunity to connect. And my mom was with me, so that was very special too, to just to kind of see that. My kids saw this, and I was trying to help them to absorb this. This is where your daddy was born and spent the first three months of his life before he came to America. Um, but also during the, that time, one of, my, one of my best highlights was to meet the closest blood relative to us. And it's my mom's uncle. And do we have a picture of him? There he is. He's right there in the center. That's him. And I got to tell you, man, that man could pull off wearing that hat. Doesn't he look good? He is styling. I mean, when I first saw him, he's like five, like one, five, two. And I saw that hat. I was just like, man, you are styling. And so, um, you know, my mom hadn't seen him in almost 50 years. We were, she went to Korea about 20 years ago, and she didn't see him then. And the reason why was because my, uh, I call him my grandfather, he had an affair many years ago. And because of that, uh, his wife, who I call my grandmother, uh, kicked him out of the house, took away all his papers, so he doesn't even have identification, and told the government that he died so that she can get some kind of government support for the children. And so that's the reality of what happened. And so when he left uh, the house, he still supported all his children to, for school schooling and everything like that. They did his best to support them so that, you know, he could do his, you know, fatherly duties. And so my mom, 20 years ago, didn't have enough courage to ask, you know, uh, her cousin and her, uh, and his, uh, her, my mom's aunt if he could meet him because they have all the contact information. And so she wasn't able to do that. And, but this time around, because he's now in his 80s, she realized she doesn't have much time left, so she wants to see him. So when she saw him, and we met at this mall, and they hugged. I mean, this is the first time they've seen each other in almost 50 years. It was just powerful, really, really powerful. My mom brought a backpack with her, and she's like, I'm going to stay with him. I don't know when I'll be back, but I'm going to stay with him because it's been almost 50 years. It's been a long time. And so she went there. And then she called me the very next day and she says, I'm coming back. And I thought, whoa, that was fast. Like, what, you getting in a fight? But she wouldn't tell me what happened. And so she came home. She came to the place where we were staying at Itaewon. And she just shared with me that she couldn't stay there any longer. There was no place for her to sleep. The place was really tiny. He lived downstairs in a basement, a real small little apartment. And he was in the basement. It was just this tiny little room. And there was no place for her to lay down and sleep. He had hardly any food in his refrigerator. Uh, he was living in utter poverty utter poverty. And because he didn't have any ID, he doesn't get a retirement check or anything like that. So the only thing he does for income is that he's got this, uh, this cart with big wheels. And he would wake up every morning and he would find recycled cardboard and he would load it up into his cart. And in about a month, he would go and then go to a recycling place and he would make about $10 for the, pay for the recycled cardboard. And so my mom is telling me all these things. You know, even though I've, I just met him, I started getting angry at my uncles. Right? His sons and my aunts, his daughter, he's got four kids. And I thought, I know he did wrong, but you don't treat your father like that. You don't just leave him like that. You got to at least get him a decent apartment to live. So I started getting angry. Like, what are they doing? How could they let their father live like this? And so we met up uh, a few days before I came back from the States. And, uh, and I didn't want to say anything because that's all sensitive stuff. But I just sat with him and I just said, in a restaurant, I said, hey, it's, life's pretty hard, isn't it? And this is what he said to me. He said, I've committed a lot of sins in my life, and I'm living under the power of that, unfortunately. But then he said this to me. He said, but you know what? I'm glad about one thing. He's like, through all of this, I found Jesus Christ. 
And he says, I go to church every Sunday, even when I'm sick, I try to make it. And you know, he's got a real bad limp as well. He's like, I don't ever stop going to church. And then he said this to me, he goes, my greatest prayer is that one day your grandmother would take me back and the few years I have left on earth, I'd be able to live with her. He's not a pastor. He doesn't go out evangelizing. I saw the glory of God fall down in that restaurant on his life. Because here's a man who embraces his weakness, doesn't live in bitterness, understands the depth of what maybe he did. And yet he finds something beautiful through it all. He found Jesus Christ. And through that, he's trying to live under the power and under the strength of God's grace for his life today. Some of you just don't get it. You've been a part of this church for so long and you still can't get to a point where you embrace your weaknesses. This is the heart of what this church is about. This is the heart of the gospel message. But for many of you, you choose not to live in that place. And my hope and my prayer for you is that as we launch into the series today, is that you would really begin to take this seriously, that you would sit and you would learn, you would reflect and you would learn to embrace your weaknesses through transparency. And as you do that, you'll be able to glorify God in a powerful way through your weaknesses, that God would be able to redeem those things in your life that look like death. But I pray that you would get it so that you can live your life for God in such a way where no matter what you go through in your life, you will still see the sweetness and the beauty of who Christ is for you in your life. And that's your choice today. I can't force you to do it. Christ can't force you to do it. My hope and prayer is that the Holy Spirit will lead you to do that today. Embrace your weaknesses and experience God's perfect strength through it. Let's pray.